Um, so thank you, Allison, for the introduction. Um, yes, my name is Christy Gray. Um, so that was my professional bio and probably stood out two things. One, how does she have that many years of experience? Because she looks so young. And two, who's interested in disorders of mitochondrial metabolism? Really? So nobody without a cause would be the answer, probably. Um, my cause was that my youngest son had this disorder which also had him on PN for over six years. So my um, area of interest and my experience is both as a caregiver and as a clinician. Um, and I give Emory props because I actually got to speak here for your genetics lecture years ago um, with another geneticist. And the fact that they're doing a genetics le lecture at Emory is a full day is awesome for their nursing students. So, um, Back to CVAC complications. This is a, a demon that we battled um, on and off for years. And it's one that any clinician who's taking care of patients um, with a vascular device is, is gonna have to deal with. So I have no commercial relationships to disclose. So at the end of this presentation, you should be able to identify factors that influence a person's ability to successfully care for CVAD. You should be able to describe four CVAD complications and best practice strategies for prevention and outline current evidence-based practice um, recommendations for prevention of CVAD complications. So I did my assessment at the beginning. If you have the slides pulled up, you can, um, just do a little scan on the little QR code. I don't know if anybody has this. I can I can tell because I'm about to do it. And if you don't do it, I'm going to know. So if you'll scan this, here's my questions for you. So if you're looking at this, here's, here's your first question. Um, I took it earlier and it was asking me if I want to retake it. So um, here we go. So which of here's here's your questions. Um, the first one is which of the following factors can impact the patient's ability to care for a CVAD? Um, is it their home environment, um, their self-care ability, their overall health, payer coverage, or all of the above? All of the above. Okay, back to the presentation, sorry for that. So the um, complications we're gonna discuss in today's presentation, um, and we're gonna spend the most time on the first two because they're the two most common complications. It's a catheter-associated bloodstream infection or a CAPC, catheter occlusion. Um, we're also gonna talk about catheter-associated deep vein thrombosis or CADVT, catheter-associated skin impairment or CASI. Um, we'll quickly go over air embolism and catheter dislodgement. So the first complication we're going to talk about is a catheter-associated bloodstream infection. So we're going to discuss the um, evolution of the nomenclature of terms defining um, infections with a catheter. So first, for years, we we did, everything was a CLABC, right? C-L-A-B-S-I, Central Line Associated Bloodstream Infection. This is a CDC surveillance term. And what that meant was basically the patient has a central line and they have positive blood cultures, or they develop within symptoms within 48 hours. They may not have the lines still, but they develop symptoms within 48 hours of that line being um, discontinued. So that was the CLABC definition. Then along came um, CRBSI, which is catheter-related bloodstream infection. Um, this was a term from the Infectious Disease Society of America, and basically this defined that three criteria had to be met. Um, it's clinical diagnosis for a patient to be diagnosed with a CRBSI. So the first one is that you isolated the same pathogen from a peripheral and from a culture from the line. Um, they had to be drawn at the same time. And the uh, line um, culture had to have at least a three times colony count over the peripheral culture. 
The next uh, criteria was that you had to have the same um, pathogen isolated from the catheter tip and from a peripheral blood culture. But we'll talk about that. You don't usually, no one's really probably culturing catheter tip. And then the last time, which is the last criteria, which is the one that we use most often, was there was a shorter time to positivity between the blood cultures that were drawn from the line and from peripheral blood cultures. Um, usually it had, it had to be more than two hours um, that they were a quicker time to positivity. So and that's called your differential time to positivity. So then in 2021, the Infusion Nurses Society, um, the INS created a new term um, called a catheter associated bloodstream infection, um, CAPC. And what this did was it sought to say that it wasn't just central lines that could cause you to have bacteremia. It was other catheters too. And they could include apheresis catheters. They could be peripheral IVs. They could be urinary catheters, fistulas. So it's, they wanted to really differentiate that it's not just a central line that can cause an infection. So for your sources of infection, um, it, you can have three sources. You can have intraluminal, you can have extraluminal, and then you can have a secondary source of infection. Um, so for the intraluminal, that means that either the infection came from within the catheter, so we're looking at the catheter hub, or maybe a, um, a fluid source, a contaminated fluid source. An extraluminal, the infection comes from outside and it's usually related to um, bacteria at the exit site or skin contaminant. And then finally, you can have a secondary source. And a secondary source um, infection usually can be, a, you, the patient could have a uh, urosepsis at the same time that they have bacteremia, or they may have, we, someone was talking about earlier, uh, translocation of bacteria. Um, we see this more commonly with our GI dysmotility patients, probably because they're full of stool. Um, they stretch the bowel wall thin, and the bacteria can translocate across a thin bowel wall easier than it can um, for a bowel wall that's not. So for pathogen identification, um, the pathogen that is usually identified via blood cultures, and we need cultures that are drawn, again, both from the catheter and peripherally if possible. Um, again, catheter tip cultures is not a common practice. Um, the, the pathogens that are most often um, found are your skin pathogens, which are Staph epi and Staph aureus. The one thing I always bring up when we're talking about pathogens is if you see someone, if you have a patient who has multiple infections, but they grow the same pathogen every single time, it's probably not poor technique. It's probably somewhere in their body. Because if you have poor technique, you don't get to say, okay, I only want to grow um, staph epi. You know, they're going to grow polymicrobial infections or they're going to grow different organisms each time that they have an infection or, or at least not the same. And I, I, the best example I can give of that is I had a patient with cochlear implants. And she had 11 infections. We were doing a review of her capsies. She had 11 infections in three years. And that's a, that's a fair amount of capsies, right? But she only grew methicillin-sensitive staph epi, so MSSE, every single time for 11 infections. So we went back, we do a review. They did remove her cochlear implants twice during those three years, both times that they were colonized with MSSE. So, but originally, I have to tell you, I mean, I saw it in the chart, you know, originally it was, you know, can we get re-education out there, the patient's technique, you know, it was, that's what it's thought about. So I always bring up the pathogens to say, it's not always bad technique. So best practice for a blood culture collection is that you scrub the blood culture bottles, their skin and the needle, needle is connector thoroughly um, before you draw the cultures with an antiseptic and that you allow all of those to dry before um, obtaining the specimen. Um, a lot of institutions, and I personally think that you should be drawing blood cultures from the catheter hub and not through the needle as connector because that's the source of contaminant. And then again, you should be drawing cultures from the CVAD and from every lumen or every lumen of the CVAD. That's important because we see that a lot where they're only drawn from one lumen and peripherally. So for CAPC treatment, um, 
The best practice recommendations for CAPC include IV antimicrobial therapy, um, catheter locks, and the decision whether you should salvage um, or remove a catheter. The decision whether you remove a catheter or try to salvage it is one based on patient stability. It's also based on the responsible pathogen that's causing the infection. And it's also on the um, patient stability, clinical status of the patient. And it's also based on loss of access. So if this patient's had multiple catheters and they only have a site left, or something, you're gonna try to salvage that catheter more so than you would a patient with their first infection. Um, when you're talking about this, uh, the selection of the most appropriate antibiotic is usually depends on the spectrum of activity of that antibiotic and it also um, the insulting pathogen and the patient's history to uh, reactions to medications that they have and product stability and dosing frequency. We try not to send patients home on QID dosing. That, that may not be their only med. They may have two antibiotics and they may have PN. And, and the more you add to it, the less likely they are going to be to um, get all of their therapy in. So when we're talking about antibiotics, um, this is probably an overview, especially for the physicians, but for the dietitians, I don't know, it's interesting to me as a nurse, um, your common uh, antibiotics that are used to treat CRBSIs are your beta-lactams, um, which include your penicillins. Penicillins have really good coverage for gram-positive organisms. Um, you have your cephalosporins, and you have four generations of cephalosporins, and if you don't get anything else out of this. It's just that to know that each generation um, has uh, coverage for different pathogens and that the further away you get in the cephalosporin class, the less likely a patient with a penicillin allergy is going to react. So a fourth generation cephalosporin, um, the patient has a much less likely chance of reacting if they have a penicillin allergy. And then your um, carbapenems. So these have it co they cover almost all bacterial pathogens, so they're great, except they're used as a last resort. They have limited stability, and they have the ability to induce um, resistance to penicillins and cephalosporins without the patient ever having either one of those drugs. So that's why they're used less often. So in the glycopeptide class, everybody knows Vanco, right? And it covers most gram-positive organisms, and it's the drug of choice for MRSA. So your amino glycosides, they're great drugs for gram negative coverage, but they have a very narrow therapeutic um, index. So the patient has to be monitored very closely for auto and uh, nephrotoxicity. And then you have your cyclic lipopeptides, which these are like DAPTO. So they have great gram positive um, coverage and they're used to treat both MRSA and VRE. So, um, the patient can also have a uh, fungi as the cause of their bacteremia, and this would be treated with um, antifungals. So you do see fungal infections more commonly in the immunocompromised patients. Um, the most common antifungals are your azole derivatives, such as fluconazole, boriconazole. Um, systemic, it's, it's interesting, systemic antifungals, they have more side effects because they are, um, eukaryotic like our human cells. So they attack human cells just like they attach, attack the fungi. So that's why you have more um, reactions like with your amphotericin. So we were talking about this at lunch, um, antibiotic lock therapy for capsies um, and for prevention. So basically the antibiotic locks are when you instill um, an antibiotic solution into the catheter lumen, and then it's allowed to dwell for a set period of time. Um, the goal is to achieve a drug level high enough to kill the bacteria um, in, within the biofilm of the catheter. Uh, the catheter locks are not typically used as monotherapy. They're usually used in conjunction with systemic IV antibiotics um, for treating a infection. There was a study last year out of Italy, is interesting, um, catheter salvage and um, a decreased CAPSI rate were demonstrated when the patient was on both antibiotic blocks and systemic IV antibiotics. So the selection of antibiotic um, to use when you're using, treating someone prophylactically for a patient who's had multiple CAPSIs, um, 
it's really guided by the susceptibility of the um, organisms that they had in prior um, infections. Um, it's also guided uh, by the patient's um, allergies, of course. So the INS nor the CDC recommend the use or, um, of antimicrobial locks unless the patients have multiple infections due to the increased risk of um, bacterial uh, superbugs. And then um, the only thing I'll say about the antibiotic locks is there's multiple that while they're out there on the market, they make for drug shortages, they may not be available. So that's something that you may be seeing. And then everybody's favorite is ethanol locks, right? We're not even gonna talk about that. We were talking about that at lunch too. So they're very effective because they lyse the bacterial cell wall and fungal infections. Um, their mechanism of action is actually to prevent um, biofilm from forming. They don't really eradicate biofilm that's already there. Um, we're gonna talk about biofilm in an upcoming slide, but um, to date, there's been no demonstrated studies that show a clinical, um, the patient developing a resistance with um, ethanol locks. So the ethanol locks have some limitations in that they usually are only used with silicone catheters because they can cause um, degradation with the uh, polyurethane catheters. Um, in order to be effective, they, from most literature says they need at least a two hour dwell time. Um, the longer they can dwell, the better. Um, and then we see this a lot and I've seen, uh, ethanol locks have no anticoagulant properties. So we see increased occlusions in patients on ethanol locks. So then there are other locks for um, prevention of capsies, and they include, you know, you can have pterylidine, which is an amino acid. It's, it's um, derived from taurine. Um, it causes, again, just like ethanol, lysis of the bacterial cell wall. You can have sodium citrate, which I think most that's the most common that's being used in the home now. And that is a der derived from citric acid. Um, it's an antimicrobial, but it does have an anticoagulant. And then a lot of times the, the best lot for the patient may be a combination lot. So they may be on um, terilidine plus citrate, citrate plus ethanol, um, and then terilidine plus citrate or heparin for the anticoagulant. So what are the obstacles to obtaining um, the different lots? Well, we all know about the ethanol lots. Um, there's one a manufacturer who has the rights to the ethanol now. And so previously where we could get a vial of ethanol, um, I think it was $30, $40, it's 500 now for one vial of ethanol. So that's why um, it's cost prohibitive now to provide the patients with ethanol. I don't know of too many people that are able to get it. Um, it's also used off label. Um, for catheter infections, but so so what's on the horizon? We were talking about this at, at lunch. Um, there's there's some debate about this one, but at, I went to the Infusion Nurses Society conference this year in April. This was like the buzz. This was microbiome from four years ago. Everybody was talking about four percent tetrasodium EDTA. Um, the manufacturer is presently seeking approval for this um, under as a medical device versus a drug, and that's to expedite the process of getting this um, to market quicker. You can use it with both silicone and polyurethane catheters, and it actually has, it's the only drug that does the, or lock that does the triple threat. It's an anticoagulant, it's an antimicrobial, and it's um, antibiofilm. So this is the only one that actually helps in the prevention of biofilm colonization. So what's biofilm? Biofilm is basically the slime that's secreted by bacteria and um, it serves as a barrier between the antibiotic and the bacteria. So it helps lead to bacterial resistance and superbugs. So biofilm is the devil, right? So fun fact, actually biofilm starts to form within 12 minutes of bacterial colonization and then on a CVC catheter that's placed, biofilm starts to form within 24 hours. So I thought that was very interesting. So best practice for lock utilization. Um, 
Some of the best practice recommendations are use of the appropriate volume. You need to make sure there's enough solution to fill the catheter and the port reservoir that's present. Um, the appropriate dwell time. Again, um, it shouldn't be allowed or it's not been proven efficacious to do, use it for less than two hours. Ideally, you wanna use it until the catheter is needed the next time. And then lock aspiration versus flushing. So when it comes to antimicrobial locks, they should always be aspirated. Um, that helps prevent um, um, antibiotic resistance. When it comes to ethanol locks, there's some debate and institutions do it differently. Some withdraw, some flush through. So I would just defer you to your institution's um, policy on that one. Okay, so an ounce of prevention slide. This slide seems so basic with these best practice recommendations that I was like, I don't even know if I want to use this. It's just, you know, too simple. Everybody's doing this. It's, it's, you know. And then I actually got to be a patient this year twice. Um, hadn't been in the hospital for 20 years when my kids were born, and I got two four day stays. So the first admission, I'm at a very rural hospital, and the line here was very bad. But in my mind, it's because of the setting, right? I had no data to back that up. And it's really probably a bias of mine that I thought that it's because of the setting. That's why. So for the surgery, I said, well, I'm going to go to the urban area. And I'm going to a well-known, well-respected hospital. That's where I, if I get to choose, I'm, that's where I'm going to have surgery. The line care is worse. So when I say worse, I mean, um, I did lower my standards. Peripheral IV, I get it. You're not, you know, you don't have to be as meticulous, right? I believe you play how you practice. And I'm telling you, they weren't doing this and then going over and doing meticulous care for a, a CBC. Um, so that's just my little, you think these things are being done, but they're not. I, in the INS standards, one of the things you never do is you don't split a flush, right? You don't use a flush before you give a medication and then after half and half, right? You would never do that. Oh, yes, they do. And they lay them in your bed in between, right? So it's, you think these things, I would have never in a million years thought they're happening, but they're happening. So I'm, I, it is basic, but we'll go through it because it's not being done. And I was thinking about your speakers earlier, and you go through all this trouble um, when you're assessing the microbiome or when you're administering micronutrients and you, you're, you're collecting data. But really, is that data... Is, what if the nurse is over here using a flush pre and post and, and the patient gets a capsian, they're more, you know, they die. So that's going to affect your numbers too. So I, I was just, while they were speaking earlier, I thought that was, that could be affecting some numbers as well. Um, so ounce of prevention is just meticulous hand hygiene, um, adherence to aseptic no touch technique. And I hope everybody, I mean, maybe not out of the nursing world, but that is you don't touch key parts, right? Um, proper scrub the hub time. I had one scrub in eight days and it was by a nursing student. So just, just saying that's not being done. When you're talking about scrub the hub time, it's really most needless connectors It's per the manufacturer's recommendation, but really most institutions at least recommend a 15 second scrub. And there was a, um, a study and it was interesting. It, it looked at three second scrubs, 10 second scrubs, and 15 seconds. And it was with 70% um, alcohol. And what they did was they contaminated these catheters, not in patients, but they contaminated them with staph, um, staph aureus, E. coli, and pseudomonas. And in the patients um, who from three seconds to 15 second scrub time, there was a 20 fold decrease in colony counts on the patient that was scrubbed for 15 seconds. So that was interesting. Um, another thing is the use of passive disinfection caps. Um, and I'm not gonna say a brand name, but we all know they're green, they're orange, they're blue. Um, these are being under, underutilized in my um, opinion. Um, sometimes people think, and this is just, a, this is up for debate, but sometimes people think they're in lieu of scrubbing the hub, but technically it's supposed to be in addition to. But I, I Listen, I'd have take, taken either. You know, I would have been happy for either. So I'm telling you. Um, and then um, you should change the seabed dressing promptly if it becomes loose or soiled. These seem, like I said, 
and we don't try not to use the same lumen for PN that we're using for blood sampling. So there have been associated increased risk of capsies when that is done. You should bundle care. If this patient's on multiple meds, um, teach them how to bundle the care into getting all the meds together at one point in time so that they're not accessing the catheter as much. Maybe they only need to access it twice a day versus four times a day. Um, minimizing catheter movement um, helps with decreasing capsies. And then the use of barriers, um, the, the disinfection caps. And then there's also um, products that you can put around the, the joints where the needle is connector and the tubing we use this a lot with our, our kids and, and especially the ones with ostomies, um, but you can actually do a barrier there as well. Um, and then the use of antimicrobial coated catheters. Um, there have been studies that shown a decrease in capsi rate when with these catheters. So the next um, complication we'll discuss is catheter occlusion. So the causes of catheter occlusion can be thrombotic. Um, it, they can have a thrombus within the lumen of the catheter, or they may have a fibrin sheath um, that's on the end of the catheter. Um, the occlusion may be due to a precipitate. Um, it can be from incompatible meds. Um, this is more of the pharmacist, so this is right up your wheelhouse, but calcium phosphorus imbalance um, and from lipid residue. And then you can also have mechanical causes of catheter occlusion. I can't tell you how many times the patients would call in on call and they, they didn't unclamp the clamp. You know, it's, it's that ever forgotten clamp. Um, they may have keep tubing. Um, they may have catheter tilt malposition, and we'll talk about that in the, later in the presentation, or they could have pinch off syndrome, which is just when the catheter is um, gets caught between the clavicle and the first rib. So for occlusion types, um, when determining the occlusion type, you know, whether it's mechanical, precipitate, um, you, you have to assume, you rule out that it's mechanical, first of all, you rule out that it's precipitate, and then you assume that it's thrombotic. So that's kind of the order in which we usually um, deal with these. So if, a, here's the question that you guys answered. If a uh, occlusion is a partial occlusion, which means it's their lines sluggish, but you can still flush. Um, you may have more pump alarms through that line. Um, they may not have a blood return. That's a partial occlusion. They can still use it, but they don't have a blood return. So if they have a partial occlusion, um, you can instill alteplase. The difference between a partial and a complete, the treatment would be the use of a stopcock. Um, and so without the use of a stopcock, it's very hard to get the antithrombotic to the actual thrombus itself because the, the line's blocked. But with the, with the stopcock use, you can actually create the negative pressure that'll pull the alteplase into the um, thrombus. So that was your question earlier that, that you have. So for thrombotic um, occlusions, the treatment, um, remove any add-on devices to assess for patency, because sometimes all you need to do is change the needleless connector. Um, you should um, reaccess a port if you're, if you're not getting able to flush or if there's an occlusion. That, that's always shocking to me as when the patient comes in for an occlusion and the port hadn't been reaccessed and that's all that needed to happen. Um, again, you can use thrombotic therapy to restore patency and this is referred over, preferred over CVAD um, replacement. Replacement is associated with higher um, hospital costs and higher complications. Um, and again, the, there's only one drug that's approved um, for restoration of catheter function, and that's the out place. You do have, it's important to know you do have PEDS and adults dosing for that, and it's based on weight and it's kilograms. So below, above 30 gram, 30 kilos and above gets two mLs. Below that, it's 110% of their fill volume. That's what you're gonna put in the catheter. And again, the use of stopcock. So for the identification of a precipitate, um, a lot of times what you wanna do is, first of all, think about what meds they're on. Are they on um, something that, look at the list, and that's where I go to the pharmacist, that is your wheelhouse. Look at their list, are they on any incompatible meds? Also, 
what was the last med they infused prior to the catheter becoming occluded. That may tell you what the precipitant is. And then sometimes you just get lucky and you know what the precipitant is because you can see it in the line. It may be rifampin or iron, and you see that because of the color. So for the precipitants, um, the treatment for these vary, um, but the ultimate goal is to increase the solubility of the precipitant so it can be um, reabsorbed. So here's your treatment for precipitants. Um, if it's an acid-based precipitant, acid-based drug, then you'd use L-cysteine or um, hydrochloric acid. You also have alkalotic precipitants, and the best treatment for those are bicarb. You can have a calcium phosphorus imbalance, and you'd use sodium hydroxide or L-cysteine. And then for lipid, the best um, treatment for that is the ethanol. So for occlusion prevention, um, flushing between meds, all meds, um, using a push pause method when you're flushing the catheter, um, instilling heparin if it's ordered when the catheter is not in use. We always recommend, or but it's hard to get direct venipec puncture for lab draws if the patient will allow it instead of pulling the labs through the catheters, but that's not often done. Um, and then if you are going to do blood sampling, choose the largest lumen, which if you don't know, it's usually the, the red lumen in all multi-lumen catheters is going to be barred catheters, it's going to be your red lumen. Um, again, avoid mixtures that can form a precipitant. And then consider if a patient has had occlusions or consider the use of an anti-reflux valve um, instead of just a neutral or positive negative uh, connector. Um, speaking of connectors, this is probably one of the most confusing things for everybody is when they say, oh, it's a positive pressure valve or it's a negative pressure valve. So when do I clamp, right? And they, they the patients ask this. Uh, most places now in INS recommendations are that you your organization be consistent and use one type so that your education is consistent. Most places are using neutral connectors now, so clamping sequence is irrelevant. But if you have someone asking you about it, basically, if it's a positive pressure needleless connector, that means that when you disconnect the syringe, it pushes um, the fluid out of the catheter. So you would want to let that process happen. So you would clamp after, um, after you remove the syringe. A negative pressure actually pulls it in, so you want to clamp beforehand. So the next... Um, Complication would be a catheter-associated deep vein thrombosis, or CADVT. So a CADVT is when fibrin extends from that CVAD and it extends through the lumen um, of the blood vessel. So symptoms of a CADVT include um, obstruction of venous blood flow. So they can have um, pain, edema, erythema um, in their extremities, shoulders, neck, or chest. They can also have engorged um, veins proximal to the DVT, and they may have leaking at the catheter exit site. Um, up to 70% of patients with a CADVT may be asymptomatic. So risk factors that increase your risk um, of a CADVT, patient-related are being over 60, um, obesity, history of thrombosis, malignancy, or chemotherapy. Your catheter-related um, risk factors would be catheter size, uh, pistoning of the catheter, which is when the catheter moves in and out, you're more likely to have a CADVT. Um, infusion of PN is a risk factor for CADVT um, or having non-central catheter tip placement. So um, when you're talking about CADVTs, your subclavian CV CVADs have shown to have a decreased incidence of symptomatic CADVTs. Um, this was in a study in patients in ICUs. And that's um, subclavian, that would be versus having using jugular or femoral. Um, subclavian and internal, uh, your IJs um, had similar risk for patients with cancer. This was just a different study um, versus the ICU. So subclavian and IJs had similar um, DVT risk. And then pigs have an increased risk of a CADVT 
unless you're using a very small pig um, and a single lumen catheter. So CADVT treatment is that you actually maintain the CVAD. A lot of pet people want to pull the, the VAD when they develop a CADVT, but you actually should maintain that in the presence of the CADVT um, if, if the patient still requires therapy, if the line is functional, um, and um, if it's still positioned, if the catheter tip is still in the correct position. So if a patient has a CADVT, they're gonna use an anticoagulant um, for three months after CVAD removal. Um, if this is not a short-term therapy, if this is a year's therapy and the, it's, the CVAD's left in place and therapy continues as long as they have the CVAD. So for patients who have cancer, um, the recommendation is that you use low-weight molecular heparin to treat a CADVT. And for patients without um, cancer, they can be treated with oral anticoagulants. So some prevention strategies for the CADVT, um, use of securement device, um, routine flushing of the catheter, avoid catheters with multiple lumens if possible, um, again, smaller diameter catheters, and then have the patient um, perform some um, upper extremity exercises as that reduces venous state. Um, there has not been any studies which um, promote prophylactic use of um, anticoagulants for C8 DVT. So the next uh, complication is catheter associated skin impairment or ACASI. So um, ACASI is when the patient has um, a a cutaneous abnormality either at the VAD site or under the dressing or near the dressing. Um, and the severity of the um, insult can range from just a simple contact dermatitis all the way up to skin tears, erosions um, with exudate and signs of infection. The, to be labeled a CASI, the, it had, the symptoms have to persist for 30 minutes um, after the dressing is um, removed. And one thing about the CASIs that, that we need um, in the nursing world so that we can um, all be on the same page is we have no published assessment scale like we do for phlebitis. So for phlebitis, you can, there's a one through four scale and you have exact parameters. We have nothing with this. So it's basically the nurse's description and note. So that's something that's the need out there for this uh, complication. And then um, if you do have a patient with skin impairment, you should, you should assess do they have an um, adhesive sensitivity? Um, do they have a, an antiseptic sensitivity? A lot of times this is just due to not letting the antiseptic dry before the dressing is placed. So that is one of the key things you need to do before you label someone as having a CHG allergy. Make sure that that is allowed to dry first. Um, and then, or is the damage caused by aggressive um, adhesive removal then ripping off the dressing? Happens. Um, prevention strategies for a CASI would be using a sterile adhesive remover when you're um, removing the dressing. Uh, again, make sure that the antiseptic is completely dry before you use um, putting a dressing over your exit site. Using skin barrier film can be helpful, um, especially for your high risk patients. Um, utilizing a hypoallergenic um, sterile dressing, if that's a possibility. You should avoid CHG in patients under two, two months or for patients with really complicated skin disorders. And then you can secure the tubing and extension sets with tubular gauze versus every nurse just pulls the tubing around and tapes it to your arm if it's a peripheral or same for the um, central, but you can use tubular gauze for patients and, and they will even go over the chest. Um, and then avoid taking blood pressure measurements um, over or near a PIC exit site. And this is just an algorithm for treating CASIs. It is actually in the INS. Um, it's an appendix in that book, and I just threw it in here so you could see it. It's actually an excellent resource. And at the bottom, there's even um, a table for which dressings to use for which type of impairment. So it's an excellent resource. Okay, and I said that we're gonna go through the last two really quickly. Um, the air embolism is another complication that we're gonna discuss 
So air embolism occurs when there's an introduction of air into the systemic venous circulation um, and it travels to the pulmonary circulation. Um, the patient may gasp when the air initially enters um, the pulmonary um, circulation. Um, the universal finding for an air embolism is um, sudden onset of dip dipsnea. Um, so if the patient just all of a sudden has shortness of breath and they have a catheter, you should be thinking about this. They may have coughing, chest pain, tachyarrhythmias. They may have tachypnea, wheezing, um, a sense of impending doom, or they may have an altered mental, mental status. So the risk, risk factors that are associated um, with an air embolus for patients with a CBAT. It includes um, that you can, you can introduce air um, into the bad from external administration devices like unprimed tubing. So that's, that's an issue that we have. You may have fracture or detachment of the catheter connection. Um, if the patient does, um, has a deep inspiration during catheter insertion, um, or removal, this increases the negative pressure in the chest and they can also get an air embolism. Um, and then um, introduction of air during a guide wire assisted catheter exchange. So, so treatment for an air embolism. Um, first and foremost, if you can, if you see it, if you locate the source of air entry and resolve the issue. So if a patient's hooked up, the first thing you should be doing is disconnecting in, ca in case it's coming from the tubing. Or if it's a broken catheter, you want to be locating that and clamping above the fracture or putting an air, um, an occlusive dressing over the fracture site. Um, obviously, initiating basic life support if needed. If that's not needed, put the patient in on their left side in a Trendelenburg position. And that um, is important because that actually keeps the air in the right ventricle, the lower part of the right ventricle, and prevents it from moving on into the pulmonary circulation. Um, if you're in a hospital, call a code. If you're in the home setting, call 911. Um, and then the nurse should obtain vascular access and put the patient on 100% O2 if it's available. So prevention strategies for preventing an air embolism includes priming and purging air from all um, administration devices prior to connection, verifying that the patient has that clamper hemostat um, with they should have several with them at all times in the event of a ruptured or da damaged catheter. Um, never use scissors near the CVAD device. I see this most often with like suture removal. And I, I can tell you, um, you think I've even had a surgeon who cut my son's line. So um, it happens, but just I would, I would, nurses are the worst about it because they chevron the line under the dressing and then the dressing sticks to that chevron and then they can't get it loose so then they'll take the scissors and go to cut it and they cut the line um, but that is a potential source for air embolism um, you should position the patient in supine position um, when the anytime the CVAD lumen is open or during removal so if you're doing a needleless connector um, change and they can lay supine they don't have any respiratory issues preventing that they should do that um, you should perform Tell the patient to perform a Valsalva maneuver during CVAD removal um, and encourage the patient uh, to, again, lay in a supine position for 30 minutes after their CVAD is removed. You do put an air occlusive dressing over the site where the CVAD was removed and it should stay in place for 24 hours. And so the last, um, the last complication we're going to talk about is catheter dislodgement. So catheter dislodgement occurs when the CVAD tip moves out of ideal placement, um, and that is the lower part of the SVC if for upper body placement or um, the IVC for femoral placement. And catheter malposition occurs either, it can be labeled as primary or secondary. So primary occurs when the catheter is being inserted and secondary occurs later, and it's usually related to uh, pressure changes um, within the chest. So signs and symptoms of catheter dislodgement include um, difficulty flushing or aspirating blood from the line, um, infiltration or extravasation at the catheter, ex catheter exit site. So if you see fluid coming out, their catheter is probably not in the right place. 
When the external line segment is longer than the original measure, measurement, um, this is why it's so important to send the patient home with the original length of the catheter because the nurse should, the home nurse should be um, measuring and comparing with each assessment. The patient may have atrial or ventricular dysarrhythmias. They may have neurological changes um, and they could have edema in the neck and shoulder. So prevention strategies include the use of sutureless securement devices. These devices can be adhesive or they may be the um, subcutaneous devices. And I don't know if you've seen those, but they hold the catheter in place with little, two little feet that adhere to the sub, subcute tissue. Um, you should only use the CVAD um, that is labeled for power injection to um, inject contrast. Um, so diagnosis and treatment of an air embolism. You should recognize that in insertions that are on the left side, they are more prone to malposition. Um, this is because um, the brachiocephalic vein is, is more um, straight across to the heart on the left side. So you'll see more um, malpositions in that. Uh, if you feel like a catheter may be out of position, you should withhold the infusion until that's evaluated. Uh, diagnos diagnostic testing for malposition includes chest X-ray or imaging with fluoroscopy. Um, the ECG is really just if you feel like the catheter tip is down in the right atrium, we can use an ECG. Um, <laughs> this seems pretty straightforward, but it's happened. Never advance any um, catheter that has come out externally back into the exit site. Um, if it, it's, it's happened. Um, and then the dislodgement may require catheter exchange over a guide wire um, to uh, replace, but we do recommend trying to replace it that way so that um, to, to maintain access sites. Okay, and so we already did the knowledge check. I didn't know if I was gonna do it at the beginning or end. This is the primary resource used in today's presentation. And um, it's, it's what we use. I'm really excited that I'm sound like such a nerd, but they're starting to do the standards now every three years. So our next standards are coming out in 2024. These are the other resources that were used in today's presentation. And that's all I have. Thank you. Like Kathleen, everybody's tired after lunch. from the midline. Well, we were just talking about midlines at lunch with Vivian. So it's interesting. And when we were talking about the nurse, the nurse didn't even understand the difference between a um, midline and a, and a peripheral. So, um, so with the midlines, we will give PPN, P, PPN through a midline. Um, we don't have a set limit, but you do have increased risk of phlebitis, malposition, um, and things with that. So. I don't think I've seen a patient administering PN with a midline for more, it's usually a temporary for more than a few weeks. And, and I, of course the PPN is not nutritionally as ideal. So I, I haven't seen it for more than a few weeks. Not saying they couldn't keep it longer. If someone in the hospital has seen that, then please weigh in. But in the home setting, I'm not seeing it. And again, monitoring, you don't have someone looking at it, monitoring it every day versus um, in the hospital.